Um, our speaker tonight is Pat Gilman from the University of Oklahoma, and um, she's really changed a lot of our thinking about uh, various topics in archaeology, but for um, uh, the pit house, uh, pit house occupation periods, it was, it was particularly interesting. So I'll just go ahead and turn things over to Pat, and we'll just go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, one of the things that I have done a lot of in my, um, turns out to be fairly long career, is I've worked in the Mimbres region of southwestern New Mexico. And I'm assuming that many of you know that the Mimbres region is famous for its black and white pottery. And it's famous for that black and white pottery in large part because of the naturalistic designs. There are designs of people doing things, there are designs of animals doing things. Sometimes those designs are very strange. Um, for example, in your handout, if you, just a second, I can do this. If you flip to the first picture, there's a picture of two bears there, and there's a picture of a person on the back of those bears, um, and what he's doing is he's gouging the eyes out of the bears. Um, we'll get back to this, I think. Um, you, that, you might not know that, but I... I'm pretty sure that's what he's doing. Um, so, um, you know, there's some things that are uninterpretable on these, apparently, and there are some things that seem very ordinary to us on these. So, members, the members area of southwestern New Mexico um, and some other places is very famous for this kind of pottery. Uh, you've probably all seen it. You might even have a refrigerator magnet that has one of these. Um, that's how appealing the images are. So why would an archaeologist like me, who has worked in and around Mimbris since <coughs> 1974, um, go out to the peripheries, if you will, of what is Mimbris, where they don't have this kind of pottery, and do research? What is the value of that? Um, and so that's one of the questions here tonight that I'm going to talk about. I think it really is valuable. It's valuable for several reasons. Uh, first of all, if we're going to talk about members, uh, we need to know everything about members, not just what's in the center. Um, if you look at the map on the first page, I have given you a map of the members region. And can you see the members valley there flowing from north to south, kind of in the center of the page at the members river? That's a great place. Has anybody been to the Members River Valley? Yeah, some of you. Yeah. Um, and um, it starts at about six, 7,000 feet, flows down into what my husband, who is here, I will refer to him as Paul, because um, that's his name, um, euphemistically refers to as the Stinking Desert. It flows down into the basin and range topography. Um, if you've taken I-10, which I imagine everyone here has, from Tucson over to El Paso or Las Cruces, you've gone through that particular basin and range, that particular part of the stinking desert. So the Mimbris and the Mimbris Valley, as you see it here on the map, archaeologists consider it the heartland of what is Mimbris. The Mimbers region, however, encompasses much of what's on this map. It starts in the north where the Mimbers River starts, uh, more or less. It comes across into Arizona a tiny bit. We aren't quite sure how much. It drops down into Chihuahua. Again, we aren't quite sure how much, but it certainly goes as far south as Pacime, as Casas Grandes, in Chihuahua. Um, there are member sites, and when I say member sites, what I mean is there are sites that have almost solely members pottery on them. 95 plus percent of the painted pottery is members black on white. Um, there's not much else. From um, Casas Grandes and Chihuahua, it swings up probably on the east side of the San Andreas Mountains, which are east of the Rio Grande and then comes back around. We aren't entirely sure it, the exact boundaries. But my point here is there's a lot to Mimbris out there besides what's in the Mimbris Valley. So think of it this way. If you were a person from Kazakhstan and you came here to the United States and I wanted to show you 
typical United States, would it be enough to show you New York City, Chicago, and Los Angeles? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a difference of opinion on that. All right. Um, I would make a case that it wasn't, um, that we Okies have something to provide <coughs> the rest of you. Um, so there's much more to the members area. There's a lot of variation out there, and we need to know what it is. So, um, okay. I have to tell you that what I'm going to talk about tonight is a work in progress. This talk right here is the first time I have presented a summary of this um, in my own mind. Um, and so please ask me questions, stop me, say that wasn't clear. Um, it prevents my husband from saying it to me. So <laughs> I'd rather hear it from you than from him. He's already said it, by the way. So, okay, let me give you a little bit of background. You know where the Members Valley is? and you know the Members Region now. Let's talk about what's in the Members Valley, and I'm talking about only the classic time period, and that time period is 1000 AD to 1130 AD. It's a shockingly uh, short period of time, frankly. During that time period, people are living in the Members Valley in Pueblos, and you all know what Pueblos are, above ground, contiguous roomed structures. Um, so, sort of like our, our own houses, in fact. Some of those Pueblos in the Members Valley have over 100 rooms. Some of them have close to 200 rooms, which for the time is a lot of rooms, um, more or less. So, and up and down the Members River Valley, this little river you see here, a distance of about 30 miles, there are between, there are 12 or 13 of these big, classic Mimbris Pueblos, okay? The Mimbris Valley is also famous for the pottery, and I have two pictures of the pottery, the one with the bears with their eyes being gouged out, um, and the one, it's, I have to have my glasses, number four, there's a beautiful geometric bowl, about 60%, 70%, of the um, members' pots are geometrics, um, but they're no less artistic than the naturalistics. They're pretty stunning bowls. Of course, I picked out a couple of pretty stunning bowls for you. I didn't pick the ugly ones. Um, but I'm trying to make a point here. The Members Valley is famous for these kinds of bowls, um, many of them from the large sites, some from the smaller sites as well. OK, beautiful pottery. Um, lots of Pueblos, big Pueblos. We've done a lot of archaeological work, relatively speaking, in the Members Valley, and so we are quite sure that people in this time period are pretty agricultural, agricultural, lots of agriculture, little bits of hunting and gathering. Um, they pretty much hunted the big game out at this point, um, but there is a little bit of it. Um, they're pretty sedentary. They stay you know, in those big sites. They may move to some smaller sites in the summertime, but they're pretty much tied into the land there. Because if you're a heavy-duty agriculturalist, you don't want to leave your land, of course. Um, let's see. And they live in these big sites for several hundred years. Um, they've been living in them for several hundred years. So, lots of continuity. They... In the classic period, at the beginning of the classic period, yeah, go. I just wanted to oh, a mic. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, when you say they've been, li you say this is a short period of time, uh -huh. but they've been living in these sites for hundreds of years. So over these hundreds of years before the classic uh -huh. period, how many people are we talking about? Ooh, that that's an entirely different talk here. <laughs> um, <laughs> A and one that um, Roger Anion, who's back there in the audience, would probably beat me up over. <laughs> um, so um, I don't think there are very many people in these sites. I think these are big sites. I think they grow through accretion. Um, and I don't think at any one time there are lots of people at them. I think that there's three or four or five or six families per site, small families, four to six to eight people. Um, and in the pit house time periods previously, I think there are fewer. Um, 
And in fact, I think in most pit house period sites that there is one family per site. But that is a completely different talk <laughs> and, and, and controversial. Um, I, I assume you all know that science is controversial. Um, that we don't all agree on what the data are telling us. And, and this is one of the fun things about doing this. Um, if we all agreed, it would be really boring. Okay, so um, in the, at the beginning of the classic period, there's a big change that happens in the Mimbris Valley, in the Mimbris Valley. And it is a change in religion. You all know what great kivas are, those huge underground communal ceremonial structures. People had been using those in the late pit house period, in the pit house period, um, before the classic. But at about 1000 AD, they've always burned them to, to retire them, pretty much. Um, but sometime in the 900s, they, they burn the great kivas and they don't replace them with anything. At the same time, they start to get scarlet macaws from the east coast of Mexico. Big, beautiful red birds, stunning birds. If you've ever seen one, the only place you can really see them now is in zoos. Um, they are stunning birds. Um, and you start to see on the Mimbrous pottery, take a look at that bear pot, you start to see Mesoamerican derived images. So here on the bear pot, what we've got, I and several other people think, is we've got the monster seven macaw, who is often represented as a bear, in the origin story that comes out of Mesoamerica. The Mesoamerican origin story, the saga of the hero twins. In the saga of the hero twins, one, one of the episodes is that um, Seven Macaw attacks the older twin and rips his arm off. The younger twin attacks Seven Macaw in the guise of a bear here and gouges his eyes out in an effort to get the arm back to reattach it, which it, he does, by the way. And that's what we see here. We see the younger twin with his fingers in the eyes of the bear, gouging the eyes out. This is a Mesoamerican, I would say, derived image uh, that you start to see in the classic period that we haven't seen before. Okay, so we get a change in religion. Keep this in mind. Okay, let's then think about for a minute what's happening in the Mimbrous stuff beyond the Mimbrous Valley. We've got all this area out here. I'm going to focus tonight on southwest, th the area southwest of the Mimbrous Valley really out there in the stinking desert, kind of in the northern boot heel, um, Lordsburg. You've all been through Lordsburg, lovely Lordsburg. Um, hmm? <laughs> I love this area. This is basin and range topography. It's Chihuahuan Desert. Um, would you expect us to get big sites? No. In fact, we get a few that are over 100 rooms. We don't get as many, though. We don't get as many. Um, is there a big river out here along which you would expect to see big sites? No, no. Um, but these big sites are at point sources of water, it looks like. The water's gone today because uh, the water levels drop so low. Um, but they're at point sources of water out there. There are a few of them. But in general, would you expect to see as many people out here in the basin and range topography? No, why not? No water, yeah. Um, Depopulant vegetation, it's the Chihuahuan Desert, it's creosote bush. Actually, there was a lot of grassland out here um, before the cattle got it. So, um, and, and that's kind of what we see. You know, there are fewer people, that is certainly true. Are there, um, Okay, we did that. Would you expect people to be sedentary year-round, necessarily? Not necessarily, they might have been. We aren't certain about this. There's been so little excavation out in this area because it's the stinking desert. Uh, you know, and the sites are smaller. They would have been using um, rainfall off the mountains 
off the mountains that are out there, the ranges, and they would have used these point sources of water, springs, seeps, to do a little bit of irrigation, perhaps, that sort of thing. But you can imagine the fields are a lot smaller under these circumstances. Yeah. Um. Oh, sorry. I'm supposed to repeat your questions. So if, if I don't do that, say, Pat, um. repeat. I also wanted to ask, at 900, when you talk about the change of religion uh -huh. and the burning of the kivas, are you already, at this early date, starting to see the ceremonial life uh, focus on courtyards? Ooh. Um, <laughs> it's not clear what replaces those great kivas at that change. There are no buildings that are big enough to house the number of people that would have been housed in a great kiva. And so we all say... Well, they did it out in the plazas. They weren't really courtyards. And we at the Members Foundation that I worked for in the 1970s when we were out in the Members Valley doing excavations, we dug some backhoe trenches <laughs> through the courtyards. But at the time, we weren't really into excavating outside of rooms. Um, but we did a little bit. And there's no prepared surface, although after a 1,000 years, what would you expect to see? You know? Um, it's been buried, though. Um, but where else are they going to do these ceremonies? They have to be doing them someplace. <laughs> the plazas are a logical place. But these are not plazas like you would see in the big Lake Pueblos along the Rio Grande, for example. You know, plazas enclosed by rooms. These are, I don't know if you've ever been to Zuni for any of the dances. There's a little enclosed plaza in Zuni. Not a plaza like that. These are open. They're irregular. You know, I don't know. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. Um, okay. So, members outside the Members Valley? Um, let's see. What about the pottery? Here's the interesting thing about the pottery, which got me going on this subject to start with. Look at the final picture with the two vessels, the two bowls on it. Those are two very typical bowls from outside the Members Valley, in this case from the Gila. If you look at the first bowl, you can see those fine line hatchers coming down. Uh, you, you see what I'm saying? And they come down and meet a single line. Though that particular way of, putting, of painting a design, that particular design, you wouldn't find in the Members Valley. I'm pretty sure. Um, if you look at the one on the right, look at the fine line hatcher. There's some long fine line hatcher that comes into some triangular things that are also fine line hatchered. You see those? Am I being clear? Okay. Um, again, you wouldn't see fine line hatcher done that way in the Members Valley. So um, I started looking at these sherds, because you don't get many whole bowls, and I started thinking, boy, that's funny stuff. Um, the funny designs, not Members Valley designs. And that's what got me thinking about Members Beyond the Members Valley. Why do they have such different designs? These bowls are very clearly Members. No archaeologist who knows Members pottery would say these bowls were not Members. The technology is the same. The size and shapes are the same. Um, the black and whiteness is the same. The designs are the same, kind of except when you start looking at them in detail, and then they're not the same. So they've got different designs on their pottery outside the Members Valley. And furthermore, they have almost no naturalistics. I told you that 30% of the pottery in the Members Valley was naturalistics. Outside the Members Valley, very little, if any, if any. Um, and so, without the naturalistics, you don't have any of those Mesoamerican-derived designs, right? You don't have anybody gouging the eyes out of the bear, out of seven <laughs> macaw. Um, so, okay. So that's the background. Some pretty striking differences. Um, so here's the part where I'm hoping, I have thought about this for a long time, and I can make little bits of sense of it, but I haven't, um, I don't have an overarching explanation to give you. I have parts of one. 
that I can give you, and I will eventually. Um, but my question is, if you were thinking about this, and I'm hoping to get some ideas from you, because honestly, I was trained by Steve LeBlanc, who you haven't, most of you haven't met, but he, um, he was of the opinion that anybody can have a good idea, um, and, and most people do, and so I'm hoping actually to pick your brains. <laughs> um, how might we start to explain why these differences are occurring? Anybody want to take a stab at that? They were expelled. Yeah, why not? These were the people who were expelled from the Mimbus Valley, and they were expelled into the area nobody else wanted to live in. <laughs> Ugh, <laughs> the stinking desert. That's a good idea. Probably not true, and I've never thought of it, though, and so I'm not sure I can refute it. Um, but let's keep that in mind. Okay, anybody else got an idea? I've got some standard ideas here. Influences from other cultures, how so? Would make the people outside beyond the Members Valley a little different. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one, too. Um, influence from other cultures would make the people beyond the Members Valley heartland a little bit different. Um, certainly that could be true. We don't find any thing offhand, you know, any statement an archaeologist makes, there's always exceptions to. So. Um, but we don't find a lot of stuff that would suggest that. There's a little bit. What time period are the two Gila bulls? Uh, 1,000 to 1130. They are classic bulls. You have <laughs> the definition of classic, one of the definitions is fine lines meeting fine lines. And you've got fine, li or fine lines bordered by fine lines. That's what you've got here. So absolutely classic. Sometimes it is hard to tell as you get out away from the Members Valley what time period the bulls are. Next suggestion? Ah. Well, um, I'm from New England. Uh huh. And w in New England, there's three kinds of bowling, and I've been looking for... And people from New England have migrated <laughs> all over the country, but I've yet to find another Candlepin bowling lane anywhere in the country. For some reason, it just stays in New England, and it yeah, doesn't travel, does. even with all the people from that region who've gone all over the country. So uh -huh. maybe for whatever reason, that didn't travel either. Yes, that's a good point, too, that the Mesoamerican stuff, that change in religion, didn't travel well. Um, and nobody else took it up. We'll come back to that, sort of, in a, in a sense, in a sense. Well, I have heard that the potters were all men. Uh-huh. And so? <laughs> he makes the statement that the potters were all women. Um, and it is possible to take that another step further and say, well, maybe a lot of the women married into the Mimbris Valley, the ones who are, going to, who are good potters, who showed um, uh, early talent for painting and for making pottery, maybe they married into the Mimbris Valley, people wanted them, and the, the poor women like me who couldn't paint their way out of a paper bag got to live in Lordsburg. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, yeah. Uh -huh. not right. She suggests that there might have been different belief systems such that the images that are present in the Members Valley wouldn't be present elsewhere. And that, I think, is part of it, too, in that, except that it's all members. You know, they're all making members pottery. Somehow claiming that the word identity is hot right now in archaeology, somehow claiming that identity. Um, but, yeah. And so you've all got, actually, those are great ideas. What about ideas. Uh, copyright? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, yes, copyright. Um, and I think that's part of it, too. Um, I'm going to get to that. If, if, okay. So archaeologists, oh, no, I'm not going to get to it. Okay. <laughs> Neither do I. Ooh, yeah, good point. I hadn't thought of that. We, we, we think, 
Oh, um, she uh, made the statement that that first bowl there on the left looks like it could be inspired by basketry. Um, we think that basketry did inspire the production of pottery, the construction of pottery early on. Um, somebody. Ooh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so he says that um, if women were the potters, given that they were, and we don't know that, but we, probably true, and perhaps these things are so nicely painted in the Mimbris Valley. I mean, I couldn't paint them, and most of us here couldn't paint them that maybe there were specialized people who specialized in painting pottery and that, that those people, a very small number of people, probably more than one, just changed their style into something else and everybody else had to go along because they couldn't paint a pot. Um, and, and I do think there is a major change in style here. Um, but I think there's something that causes it. Oh, okay. Right, they are. They are. So, but to say that they had some Somebody else mentioned that, yeah. Yep. She asked if the Hoakam had any influence here. The answer is yes. We see some influence in the pottery designs before 1000 AD, not in this time period. Some of the pottery looks a lot like Hoakam designs. It doesn't have the red on bottom, but it right. looks a lot. Yeah, but it looks, yeah, but the designs. But that kind of drops out in after 1000. And I believe we have another suggestion here. I would suggest that a generational change would make more sense than an individual changing their decorating style. Mm -hmm. Yes, one of the things she suggest. oh, you had the mic, never mind. Um, <laughs> one of the things that happens when you, as a potter, as a painter, you start to change your designs is, will people accept it? And so if you paint something crazy, are people going to accept it? Are they going to buy it? Are they going to want to use it? Are they going to say, that's just so creepy that I, I don't want anything to do with it. I'm not going to eat out of that bowl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I would just agree with you that those aren't all calm designs. The guy laid out the old ones are all calm. Ah, okay. Could be. She, she makes the case that these two um, members, pots out from outside the members Valley have a whole calm design and layout to them. Um, which they easily could. My grasp of Hoakam is pretty low. Uh, suggestion over here. Uh, I'll get back to you. <laughs> water in the desert is vital. Those who find water in the rare spots through either potholes or tanahas uh -huh. will guard those tanahas feverishly. Mm -hmm. These could be maps to the watering holes, uh -huh. specific village by village, person by person, uh -huh. where they had the water. And so in code uh -huh. would be uh -huh. a map to the Tanahas. Uh -huh. It could be. If, it, if so, we've never decoded the maps. We've looked at these geometric designs since forever. And nobody has made any sense out of them. No two members' pots are the same in geometric designs. And if you look, well, I didn't give you a good one. But, um, well, look at the one on the right. Look at that one. Um, that setup um, is a very standard kind of thing. You see those individual elements in lots of geometric members' pots, but no two members' pots are exactly the same. And so, you know, we have put pictures of members' pots on the walls and tried to move the ones that are most like together, or we've put pictures of members' pots on the walls and said, okay, here are all the pots from this room, here are all the pots from the room next door to it, um, here are all the pots from this room block. We don't see any similarities. Um, uh, a room block, a collection of these rooms, doesn't necessarily have more rabbits than the next room block, which might have more fish. That doesn't work. We've tried to get that to work. We have tried and tried and <laughs> tried to get that to work, and it doesn't work. Um, so decoding these geometric pots 
is takes a finer eye than we've been looking. One of my PhD students is doing exactly that. See the zigzags on the right part there? He is looking at elements like those zigzags, and he's saying, okay, can I see this in clusters of rooms at a site, and can I therefore say there are work groups that are working together that share that particular version of the zigzag? That's how fine he's gotten. Um, and he thinks he can, but it's still not perfectly clear. So there you have it. Um, my, my background is as a Mayanist, uh -huh. and of course, it's screaming to me, and I'm sure this has been mentioned to you, the time of the classic Maya collapse, the Highland Maya collapse, mm -hmm. coincides exactly. It does, doesn't it? Doesn't it, yeah. yeah. And, and it makes me think perhaps there was a core Mesoamerican group mm -hmm. uh, of a couple of families who <laughs> settled in the, in the, the, in the, the central region, yes. and the, on the periphery they were, you know, they adopted some things. I mean, the, the indigenous uh -huh. people uh -huh. who may have been very much more Hohokam uh -huh. um, just didn't do the Mesoamerican things, which then died out uh -huh. after a couple of generations. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I hadn't thought, actually. Nobody has, has ever mentioned to me that the classic Maya collapse at about eight or 900 A.D. is... Da is about the same time as this stuff gets going here. Um, there are, there is some DNA evidence of some women from Mexico, not from as far south as the Mayan area, um, but from sort of Durango, Zacatecas, that area, um, in the Mimbris Valley. Two or three. We've done very little, D very little DNA work, um, and so there is the possibility that people. A few people were coming north um, and bringing this Mesoamerican, these Mesoamerican derived symbols and the scarlet macaws with them. Um, okay. Let me, if I may, take a look at some of the ways that archaeologists have thought about these issues. Um, and I have five of them here, and none of them is mutually exclusive. Um, all of them, except the first one, perhaps, have possibilities here for explaining the differences between the m people in the Mimbris River Valley and people on out beyond the river. Um, we're going to end up down here um, at identity. So I know you can't read this. Um, I, I don't think you can. Number one is under the thumb, where people outside the Mimbris Valley, under the thumb, of the people in the Mimbris Valley. And in the 1990s, a couple of my colleagues and I did the first neutron activation study of Mimbris pottery. And we looked at exactly this matter. We looked at four sites in the Mimbris Valley, sherds from four sites, and one site way beyond the Mimbris Valley, out across the border in Arizona on the Gila River, just across the border. So quite a ways, 60, 70 miles from the Mimbris Valley. It's called Powers Ranch. And we proposed that if people outside the Mimbris Valley were under the thumb of people inside the Mimbris Valley, then all of the pottery should have come from the Mimbris Valley, that you would have to get your fancy pottery, your pretty pottery from people in the Mimbris Valley. Um, all of the pottery at Powers Ranch was made at Powers Ranch. So that chucked that right out the window. Um, good thing, too. Um, the second thing that archaeologists often talk about when they talk about these kinds of things is they say, well, you know, the people out on the boundaries, the people out of the, beyond the heartland, I hate these words because I don't think they describe what's going on. The people beyond the heartland are just emulating what's going on in the heartland. They're jealous. You know, they don't live in the heartland. They don't live in the Mimbris River Valley. They wish they did. And so they just sort of try to make their lives as if they were living there. Um, and there is some of that. I mean, this is Mimbris pottery we're seeing out there. And certainly there are Puebloan sites out there. Some of them are big, some of them are small. No surprises there. But there's also some different kinds of sites out there that we don't see in the Mimbris Valley. When we're out here recording, which I do 
every summer I can with the Bureau of Land Management's money. This is your federal dollars, so you have an interest in, my, um, in me doing well out there. Um, um, when we're out there, we find a lot of rock shelters. We don't find in the Members Valley. We find a lot of bedrock mortars, you know, those holes in the rocks where they were grinding, uh, mesquite perhaps. Um, so we find different kinds of sites out there. Also, but better data than that is, that, is the pottery itself. I mean, you could make a case that they're trying to emulate members' pottery, but they're not doing a very good job of it. Ah, you know, that's got a lot of holes in it. Um, if they were trying to emulate members' pottery, why aren't they emulating the naturalistics? Why aren't they making those, even if they did a crappy job of it? So that doesn't hold up very well. Another way of thinking about this that archaeologists often use is that the people in the areas beyond the Members Valley are simply support mechanisms for people in the Members Valley, that they're providing plant foods or animal foods or other goods like obsidian that the people in the Members Valley can't get or don't have enough of. But we've already talked about this. I mean, how much agriculture can you do in these areas compared to the Members Valley? Are, are these people really going to be contributing agricultural products? Are they going to be contributing animals, wild animals, meat? Maybe, maybe, maybe the big game isn't hunted out as much. Are they going to be contributing something like obsidian, which is not available in the Members Valley, but which people in the Members Valley use and like? Um, there is a wonderful obsidian source right down here on the Mexico border, right above the word Chihuahua, um, called the Antelope Wells Obsidian Source. In southern Arizona, in the Basin and Range, Antelope Wells is a very common source for the obsidian. In the Members Valley, you never see Antelope Wells obsidian. So um, they've got stuff that people in the Members Valley might like, but it doesn't get there. So that one doesn't hold up very well in my mind. Another way of thinking about these sites beyond the Members Valley is were they seasonal? Did people from the Members Valley come to this area? There's nobody living there permanently and um, get stuff, plants, animals, obsidian. Again, there's no evidence that that would be useful to anybody. And in fact, some of these sites, as you get down into the boot heel, are a good 60 miles from the Members Valley. If you were interested in stuff, in food, in obsidian, from the um, basin and range topography, you could just go south to the Deming Plain. I mean, that's the same topography. So if you wanted antelope, um, you could just go south, providing you hadn't hunted them all out. So again, this doesn't seem like it really covers things. So I'm left with this identity thing. And here's my current story. Um, these people living beyond the Members Valley are part of what is Members. They say that by making Members pottery, pottery that's very clearly Members. Um, but they have a different identity. They are a different group, New Yorkers versus Okies. Maybe, I don't know, I don't love that. But, because um, I end up being the Okie. Um, <laughs> yeah, we do have a great football team. Um, well, not as great this year as next year. Um, they have a different identity. And they have made that clear by not putting the naturalistics and not having the Mesoamerican derived designs. As far as we know, there's one macaw out there and it's at a site in the Borough Mountains, which is uh, kind of southwest of the, west of the Members Valley, about 30 miles. Um, so they're apparently not participating in this fancy Mesoamerican-derived religion that appeared out there, as far as we can tell, at least from the images on the pottery. So, as I was talking this through with my husband this, uh, this morning, um, he pointed out to me that 
one of the reasons to do this kind of research out here in the boonies, out here in the stinking desert, is to, one of the things that's shown us is the contrast between people who are apparently not participating in this religion and the Mimbers Valley itself. That there's a contrast there that we didn't know existed. We didn't know that these people beyond the Mimbers Valley were doing something different and perhaps not participating in this religion. It makes the Mimbers Valley all the more unique. Um, that even within Mimbers, what's happening in the Mimbers Valley is stunning and scary and really interesting. Um, okay, is that enough? <laughs> I think it's a great point, great point to open the floor to questions. Yeah. I see the first one over here. Oh, and if you don't want to ask a question on the microphone, we have pads of paper and pins on all the tables. Just go ahead and pass me a uh, note when I, when I walk by, and I'll read the question when we get a moment. I'll use the term religion for what you're talking about. Whether Yeah, exactly. But if what I if you have too. a multi-level religion in which some the most core beliefs can only be put into a specific area. I strongly would suspect that in like the Mormon religion, there are things that can be done in a temple that cannot mm -hmm. be done in a standard yeah. uh, church, whatever it's called, yeah. or in yeah. the, and this is exactly what you've got is the most core heavy belief is this, this um, uh, Mesoamerican stuff, and it can't go beyond that area. Yes, and, and this got mentioned in s different ways earlier. And I do think that that could be happening. Many of us archaeologists who have worked in the Mimbrus region for many years um, think that there are two sites within the Mimbrus Valley, the Galaz site and Old Town, that were special religious sites. Um, Galaz has half of the macaws and parrots um, excavated from the Mimbrus Valley. Uh, it's got a huge uh, kiva complex that continues through time, as does Old Town. Fantastic stuff. Um, it looks like during the classic period that Galaz is um, the major pottery producing site in the Mimbrus Valley and therefore in probably in the Mimbrus region as well. And so we think that it's not just the Mimbrus Valley, it's also within that a couple of sites. But uh, you all may know that in Puebloan religion today and probably for the last thousand years, um, there's a level of secrecy that outsiders, even outsiders who belong to the same ethnic group, the same Pueblo, don't know. That religious specialists know things that other people don't and can't know. Um, that it's too powerful. Um, or if other people knew it, it would dilute that power. And so this may be what's happening here, is that we see um, certain people, certain families, um, controlling that religious knowledge in the Members Valley. Possibly. Next question is here. Um, I'm a science writer, and I've written a lot about ancient DNA, and I was quite startled by your mention of DNA. Uh, could you go into some detail? Where is it from? Wh how do you how do you obtain it? How do you analyze it? How old is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's pretty common nowadays um, to use human skeletal remains uh, from archaeological sites, not common, common, um, to extract DNA from. The DNA, unlike dinosaurs, the DNA isn't all gone. Sometimes it has decomposed and you can't get any. Often people use, as I understand it, I don't understand it, but often people will use teeth because those last longer. Um, they're very hard, um, and so there are a number of anthropologists who's, archaeologists who focus on genetics, biological anthropologists, a number of geneticists who focus on ancient DNA, uh, ancient genetics. And so there is, there are pretty massive databases from around the world now, both of DNA from ancient people and DNA from modern people. Um, is that? But the DNA you're talking about comes from skeletal remains in the Members Valley or yes. in these outlying yeah. places? Yes, and there's only so been... So the dates are uh, 1,000... The dates of 1100? these are 1,000 to 1130-ish. 
as I remember them. There may be one that dates into the 900s, but I'm not certain. Next question. She asks if the members left any petroglyphs, a form of rock art. Yes, we do have petroglyphs. And one of the questions is, in my mind, is how much Mesoamerican, how many Mesoamerican images are there in the petroglyphs? And there certainly are some. And do we see those images out beyond the members' valley? Um, uh huh. Yes, it does. Yes. Yes, and Three Rivers, she asks about Three Rivers Petroglyph site, which is on the east side of the Rio Grande uh, by, by Tularosa, um, which is very members, very members Im imagery, a lot of mi members imagery on it. Um, there's a lot of relationship with the Juanada Maguillon across the Rio Grande, but also I pointed out to you that there are straight member sites across the Rio Grande. And so one of the things I hope to do um, in the next couple of years is map out where member sites are, how far east do they go, how far north, how far south, and what then we would know, well, is that set of petroglyphs within what is members, or is it outside? If it's outside, we've got some talking to do. I'm hoping it's inside. <laughs> but those are members' images, that's exactly correct. Uh, great place to visit if you haven't visited there. Next question is here. Yeah. Changes in religion generally become very traumatic. Yeah. And <laughs> it may well be, you know, you look at some of the things that happened in Egypt <coughs> and other places, that when the Central Valley accepted that sect, Mm -hmm. that you had sectarian uh, schisms, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which deliberately went out of the way. D is there any prior um, a model mm -hmm. for these fine lines? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's an excellent point, that there can be schisms, and perhaps these people beyond the Members Valley were people who said, oh, that new religion is crap. It's We don't want to do it. Um, instead of it just being secret and confined to the Members Valley. I think that's entirely possible. Um, the mem this new religion, by the way, lasted only that 130 years in the classic, in the Members area, after which things completely reorganized in the Members area. Um, you know, however, that parts of that that Mesoamerican iconography, the, the hero twin story, those are called the war twins in the modern Pueblos. And so parts of that continue on today, but parts of the great Kiva religion, of course, continue on today too. There are great Kivas in most all of the modern Pueblos that are used actively. And so it, it fails in the members, um, but it continues on in other parts of the Southwest, in other ways, in other ways. Um. We have some questions here in the back. Sure. Bruce? Donna, can you yes. give us just a sec, yes. please? Thanks, I'll get Doug. back to that. <coughs> is, is this on? Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and I'm, I apologize also for being so dense, but going back to the story of the hero twins, could you? I thought I understood you to say that in the story from the Mesoamerican story, the hero twins were doing battle with a macaw, but it was represented as a bear. Yep. yep. Now I'm assuming that the representation of a bear to represent a macaw has a time. I mean, that comes from Mesoamerican iconography. Yes. Okay. Yes, I have no clue what that connection is. Seven Macaw is this monster's name. I'm not sure he's a macaw, um, but it's his name. It's a monster. Although the monster, if it's not a bear, it's often a monstrous bird. So, but I'm not sure that bird's a macaw. I don't know. Next question here. 
hi, Pat. As somebody who works in the Gila, I'm uh, way back in the Where back. Where are you? Just a second. The it's really hard to see up here. <laughs> I am that far away. Hi. Ah, OK. Uh, way back in the back. Um, as somebody who works in the Gila, I'm, I'm really excited about the discussion of differences in styles between um, the boondocks and the members. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm curious to know, so members classic grows out of members style one and style two, these earlier black mm -hmm. on white types. Yeah. So do you see the difference, the, the geographic differences in the earlier pottery types or is this really something that arrives with the classic? Yes. Yes, I had the first pottery type in the member sequence is something called Maguillon Red on Brown, and it's red on brown. I had a grad student many years ago do a study of all the whole Maguillon Red on Brown vessels. There are 30 of them. And she could see the difference between the Gila, ones from the Gila Valley and the ones from the Members Valley. Then I had another grad student more recently do a master's thesis on boldface black on white, which is the first black on white uh, pottery. And he could also see the difference between the Gila and the Mimbris designs. And so this um, difference in design goes back as far as the earliest painted pottery. It could easily go back farther than that in other ways that we don't know. Uh, but this is a long-term thing um, that the Western members, I call it, um, is different always once you get painted pottery than the stuff in the members' valley is. Did I answer that? Okay. okay we have another question about the uh, so-called kill holes in the bowls. We see so many bowls that have the whole hole knock uh -huh. knocked out. Yep. Has there been any updates on the thinking about those particular... Uh, and I have a grad student <laughs> um, <laughs> who is currently writing her thesis on the kill holes. Those are the holes that people poked in the vessels. Many of the vessels that are with burials have these kill holes, some of them don't. Um, but nobody has ever studied whether who gets what. Is it just adults who get kill holes? Is it kids? Is it women? Is it men? Is it people at this site but not that site? Is it people um, using a certain style of pottery? Are only the naturalistics killed? Um, and she has looked at all of those things. Some, oh, and some of the kill holes are, are go from out to in, and some of them go from in to out. Um, she's looked at all of those things. She can't find any patterns. <laughs> it's good research. Um, that kind of result is very valuable, but it's not what we expected. We expected there to be some patterns that we just hadn't seen because we hadn't looked for them, but she hasn't found any, so. Um, Right over here. Yeah. I was wondering if there wouldn't be a parallel between uh, Paris and the new art movement and incredibly complex, beautiful designs in competition with each other as compared to the Members Valley with a tight-knit community mm -hmm. as opposed to the Boonies in France and the boonies uh -huh. in Arizona, New Mexico, that would account for the, shall we say, cruder designs and less innovative out on the uh -huh. edge? And certainly, um, my husband made me take this part of the talk out. Um, uh, certainly, one of our stereotypes in United States culture is that people who live in Oklahoma are really hicks. And, and we aren't very smart, and we aren't very creative. And if we were to develop an art style, <laughs> nobody would buy it. Um, <laughs> and so, actually, we do have some art styles. Um, but anthropology teaches us that all people have, for the last 40,000 years, have the same brain size and complexity around the world. Um, and all people's lives have value, and all people are making a living in some way that's useful to them, that they find satisfying and useful, hopefully, unless things are going really badly. And so I, I, I want to steer you all away from that hick image um, of people living out in the basin and range and being not quite smart um, and not as creative, because certainly they were. Um, but for some reason, they're out there. And they're doing something that's pretty interesting. 
Um, in some ways, I forgot to mention this when somebody made this point, in some ways these pots that you see that are from beyond the Mimbers Valley are the pots that I think people might have painted if they hadn't gotten that Mesoamerican stuff coming in. You know, if they had just continued to be members, regular old members during the classic period for that 130 years, they would have painted these ordinary black and white pots that fit in every place else in the Southwest, in the Pueblo and Southwest. Um, but they didn't. Um, they got, somebody got this Mesoamerican stuff. That's another talk. Um, um, and I have no evidence about how they got it. And so it's not much of a talk. Um, but, but it is really interesting to think, well, why did they do things so differently? And this gets back to my point of if we're going to understand something like members, we have to understand the whole thing. We can't just look at the pretty, fascinating pots in the members' valley as much as we love them. Um, and we do. Um, we just can't look at those alone. Um, there's other stuff, and sometimes the comparison between what people are doing beyond the Members Valley and what they're doing in the Members Valley highlights the Members Valley itself even more, and that's a pretty valuable thing. Uh, hello. I know one of the big questions in members has always been, where did they go afterwards? After, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I, I was reading uh, Steve Lexon's History of the Southwest. That was back in 2010. Uh -huh. And I remember he left it as kind of an open question because it was really new. He mentioned a very large post-classic site that they were just beginning to excavate. And that was on our side of the border, not Pakeme <laughs> or anything like that, on our side of the border, not to you know, deming Lorsburg area. And I'm wondering if there's any updates on that. Um, first of all, we don't know precisely, let me correct Steve Lexon, <laughs> an easy thing to do. Um, um, we don't know precisely where each individual or each family went when, because most people pulled out of the Members Valley after about 1130 for several decades, not forever, but for several decades, we think. Um, for certainly some of them just hopped over the Black Range which is there on the eastern side of the Members Valley, rises to 10,000 feet, and drop down onto the terraces that overlook the tributaries to the Rio Grande. Uh, Peggy Nelson and Michelle Hegman at Arizona State have done extensive research over there. It's Members stuff. It tends to be, much of it's just a little bit later than what's in the Members Valley. So we do know where some of these people went. Um, but by about 1180, 1200 or so, people are making in the Members region, um, adobe walled pueblos instead of rock walled pueblos, and they're making completely different kinds of pottery. Um, and there is a site that Steve Lexon's referring to, the Black Mountain site. Um, it's northwest of Deming at Black Mountain, and, um, and it is post-classic. Katie Putt Savage, one of his students, is doing that for her dissertation, and so we're all uh, eagerly awaiting her dissertation um, to see what she thinks about what's there. Um, but it's very clearly, it's not members. It's very clearly something later than members. And there's not much continuity. But they may still be many of the same people. You know, you can change the way you do things, um, even if you're old. <laughs> um, I have um, this woman over here mentioned, but didn't get to say it publicly. Um, that there are macaws in Chaco Canyon. You all know Chaco Canyon. It's exactly contemporary with Mimbris. Um, there's nothing Mimbris in Chaco Canyon. There's nothing Chacoan in Mimbris. Well, there's one pot. Um, <laughs> one. There are 10,000 painted Mimbris pots. There's one Chaco pot. Um, and but they have 39 macaws. We have 19 or 20. So they have twice as many macaws. Um, I think the macaws are coming from the same place-ish on the east coast of um, Mexico, southeastern Mexico. But it's not, I think they must be getting them separately uh, because there's no evidence of connection between members and Chaco. One of the great puzzles of, um, and you don't see the Mesoamerican iconography in Chaco either. 
which is interesting. Anyway, it is a puzzle, but it's not my puzzle. <laughs> okay, uh, we have time for one last question. Over here. We can hear it. Going back to your very, very first point, uh -huh. um, is there a possibility that some of this is based on the fact that out in the boonies, your, your, your work week for survival is going to be considerably longer mm -hmm. than your work week for survival uh -huh. in the membranes area because of the rivers, the uh -huh. you know the uh -huh. better better things. So could some of this be based just because of the survival times? Well, you know? and another way to put that is the environments are different, so therefore, of course, people are going to be different. And that's exactly right. And one of the things, as I get further along in my research, that I'm going to have to do is factor out the environment and say, you know, this is not due to the environment. Um, and in fact, one of the ways to think about this, um, again, this comes from my husband, um, <laughs> sometimes I have to say he has good ideas, um, is think about the Gila River to the west. That's a big river like the Mimbris. And, and so it's very similar, you might think, and perhaps, and for the sake of this argument, let's think that it, they're two very similar rivers, but yet we have something very different happening on the Mimbris in terms of religion than we have happening on the Gila. And so in, in this case, if those two are as similar as we might think, then environment has no, um, nothing to do with this. Okay, well, I would like to thank Pat for honestly one of the best archeology span cafes we've ever had. Um, and <laughs> That's I'd like scary. To thank all of you because <laughs> the whole idea of this. <laughs> The whole idea behind Science Cafes is a conversation rather than a lecture, and I think we've had a really great conversation tonight, and thank you all for all of your excellent questions. That really drives um, just a fascinating evening. So and thank you, you all, all for being willing to talk about this. Um, I didn't know if you would be or not. <laughs>